Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, cutting our way through history and going in search of lithics and other various sundry things. As always, glad to be here in the Cross Time Pub. Hope you are all doing fantastic out there in the podcasting universe. Joining me, as always, are Jason Pentrail and James Waldo, the Seven Ages Research Associates. Gentlemen, how are we? Well, I am doing great. It is warm. The pollen is beginning to fall already. I haven't even made it to March yet, and it's already getting yellow out there. But uh, you know what? Weather's been great. Uh, I've had some really cool opportunities here lately. Um, Had some folks and friends. Actually, a listener of our show came down to the Charleston area. We went and did some fossil hunting. Uh, So Rin Harvey, she's a a fantastic artist and listener of the show and uh, someone I got to know a lot better while she was here. So we were able to get out there and hit the creeks. Uh, She is a wonderful, absolutely incredible artist. And Uh, I would encourage everyone to follow her on Facebook and check out everything that she's got going on. She is really, truly talented, and it was a real pleasure to get to meet up with one of our listeners and make a brand new friend. Well, that sounds fantastic. I miss those very same creeks, and so, Ren, I know exactly where you've been, and of course, I hope to be back there at some point in the future myself. James, I hear it's not quite so warm a little further west where you are, you know, here in the Appalachian Mountains even. It's a balmy 56 degrees outside right now. Not so much. A little cooler out your way, huh? Yeah, I'd say we have a complete meteorological juxtaposition uh, on our current situations. It is an ice storm here, literally. We've had freezing rain since yesterday. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, been very interesting. And I, I got to love with you. I don't like cold weather at all, ever. So uh, it's not that great. That's right. See, I knew you'd be wishing you were back in Savannah, although actually I know it's wonderful over there in Arkansas. I love the mountains where you are. I hope to come over there and visit you as well, my friend. I got to tell you, too, uh, you know, in terms of the warm weather that we have right here versus the Pleistocene like temperatures you're experiencing right now. I got to say, I'm with Jason. I am looking forward to that nice little yellow coating on White Pond when you get out there to the wonderful archaeology sites and you're having a hard time breathing because of all the pollen in the air. Yeah, it seems like about this time of the year, I begin to crave that. Let's let's be real. Nobody retires and moves up north, right? Nobody really likes cold weather. Spring is good. Some people don't like really hot weather. I actually do. I like I like hot weather. I'm, you know, I've got that thin Southern blood and that's kind of where I thrive, but fall probably is my favorite season. Yeah. Spring is the season for archaeology. Yeah. I tell you though, if we head across the pond, some archaeologists have been celebrating a different kind of a spring season because as excavations ensue over there in the desert in Jordan, something fascinating was found near Amman. NPR reporting here that a team of Jordanian and French archaeologists said that earlier this week they had found a roughly 9,000-year-old shrine at a remote Neolithic site in Jordan's eastern desert. Have you guys seen this yet? No, I've been following the news uh, news pretty closely, but I have not seen this one. Yeah, this one came across my radar, and I got to tell you, anytime I see anything this old, and especially from this part of the world, I get excited. As NPR had to say, the ritual complex was found in a Neolithic campsite near large structures known as Desert Kites. What they mean by that, by the way, are mass traps that are believed to have been used to corral wild gazelles for slaughter. Now, what does that sound like, guys? Hmm, sounds like a buffalo jump. Yes, congratulations. Bingo! It's like a Neolithic Middle Eastern equivalent 
of that. Now, as they note in the article here, such traps consist of two or more long stone balls converging toward an enclosure and are found scattered across the deserts of the Middle East. Now, that sort of reminded me superficially, that description of a fish weir, right? But as they note in this NPR article, the site is unique first because of its preservation state, that according to Jordanian archaeologist Wael Abu Aziza, co-director of the project, he says it's 9,000 years old and everything was almost intact. Now, you know, at other sites that we have seen in parts of the Middle East, of course, Gobekli Tepe comes to mind. We did a two-part episode about that a while back. One of the reasons for that state of preservation has to do with the intentional burying of Gobekli Tepe. Now, I don't know that that was necessarily the case here, but again, this site in Jordan certainly was incredibly well preserved. And it's always exciting when you have the preservation of a site that old, because, I mean, again, it's like a window into time. Of course, we'll have this linked in the show notes so that all of you at home can check this out. We'd love your thoughts about this. The idea that we are literally getting a perspective on the ancient world and an unprecedented one from 9,000 years ago. Guys, that just excites me to no end. Yeah, every week we're getting more and more news from all over the world. It just seems like the last few years, uh, the, the amount of news, the amount of discoveries has just been exponential. And uh, every week, again, it's it's a new story. It's uh, things moving back further, again, with the advent of science and technology. Dating is getting tighter. It's getting better. Uh, we're seeing history move further back in time. A lot of these sites are being reevaluated. And uh, it just seems like every couple of months or even every couple of weeks now, we're really getting a profoundly significant story in the world of archaeology from all over the globe. And it really is exciting time. And the next news story tonight is something that comes from one of, one of our favorite journals, the Mammoth Trumpet. So uh, if you haven't subscribed to this one, it's produced by the Center for the Study of the First Americans at Texas A&M University. And it is a fantastic journal. I look forward to getting it with each episode. Now they're talking about uh, perishable technologies. Uh, this particular article is written by Katie Dykus, and it caught my attention right away because it features two former guests of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So this is sort of a dual approach article featuring J.M. Adavazio and Tom Dillahay. So again, I would point you back to our catalog if you want to learn more about either one of these gentlemen. They are both profoundly influential in the world of uh, North American and South American archaeology, for that matter. And uh, they've sort of teamed up with their information here on this article. So the, uh, the actual article, Perishable Technologies, A Window into Understanding Paleo-Indian Material Culture. So as we all know, getting those human remains from the paleo period uh, is extremely important for the DNA studies also to understand more things about the material culture, but they are extremely scarce, as we all know. Um, very rarely do you have the opportunity to come across uh, such a discovery as that. However, in their absence, perishable artifacts being handmade objects, uh, they also serve as a, a proxy role for offering a glimpse into that personal level of material culture. So quoting from uh, the article, quote, soft technology which is a term coined by Robert L. Bettinger, he's a professor emeritus at the University of California, Davis, is a valuable resource. Nevertheless, it isn't being put to work by archaeologists, certainly not with the intensity that would satisfy Tom Dillahay. Dillahay, the discoverer of a culture at Monteverde in Chile that sounded the death uh, call for the Clovis first model, laments fellow archaeologists who prize lithic artifacts associated with hunting while overlooking perishable technologies. What is lagged in our discipline, he tells us, is a rigorous search to discover perishables in both dry and wet environments. So again, if you're familiar with the Monteverde site, you will understand the extreme value of the amount of perishable artifacts that were found at that location. It's almost unprecedented in many ways uh, and really put Tom Dillahay on the map. Now, the article goes on to discuss European uh, discoveries of perishable artifacts and how they relate back to what we can understand here in North America. And then uh, continuing further in the article, we see uh, them begin to discuss the perishables that's been found. So again, quote, the relative abundance of recovered lithic artifacts compared with perishables doesn't mean that they were more important to the ancient culture. Research into a dry cave in central Mexico with nearly perfect preservation reversed the idea 
that stone tools were more widely used than perishable artifacts. Researchers found the average ratio of stone to wood to plant fiber artifacts was 1 to 6 to 26. In other words, perishables outnumbered artifacts made of wood by a factor of 4 and were 20 times more common than stone tools. Atavasio finds this ratio repeated in hundreds of dry caves, rock shelters, and other contexts where preservation conditions ensure accurate representation of the relative proportions of artifacts of all classes and compositional media. So we have many examples and great pictures, great photos in this article showing um, different fragments of uh, fabrics, different Mattings, different types of cultural material, if you will. So things that we don't normally get to see and are absolutely fascinating. So again, I would uh, encourage anyone who hasn't subscribed to the Mammoth Trumpet to do so. But also keep in mind as we move forward, hopefully we'll find one more or two more of these key paleo sites that's going to have that material culture present and allow us to learn that much more about it. Because every little scrap uh, or piece that we can recover from that time period is going to uh, kind of rearrange what we thought was possible. I remember when the discovery at Wendover Bog down in Florida, in Titusville, Florida, uh, when that discovery was made, it rewrote what we thought about the archaic period. So again, these paleo pieces, these paleo straps are key to understanding everything outside of the famed Clovis fluted points that we uh, all in the world of archaeology think so highly of, and they are indeed prized, but we're missing so much of the overall picture. Yeah, well, we only work with what we can see or what we can often immediately find, and there's a tremendous amount of bias involved right there. Again, as Adavazio pointed out in the Mammoth Trumpet article, that proportion 20 to 1 in favor of the perishable technologies but it's sites like Monte Verde where you actually find more of the of those preserved perishable technologies, it really kind of opens up the past and shows you what things were really like. We place that emphasis on the stone technologies because inevitably those are the ones that are preserved. Those can last the test of time. Sites like Monte Verde and a few others are unique in the sense that they allow that preservation and they give us that rare glimpse of what ancient people's lifestyle was really like, the technologies that they really used. And I got to say, this has been a drum that has, thank goodness, been beat by Atavasio and by De La Haye for decades. Put aside what you think you know based on what little you can see, and, you know, apply some logic. I mean, in your daily life, look at all the woven fabrics that we wear. Look at, you know, the way that we use fishing nets, use, you know, different kinds of produced materials from plants and from all different kinds of sources. In the ancient world, people were absolutely doing the same kind of thing. Just because we don't always see that at archaeological sites does not mean that this was not an integral part of their way of life. And again, that proportion, 20 to 1, that says it all. Yeah, I mean, that's, that really does say it all. And during the story, I, I thought about that. And I like to think about um, you know the ancient past in terms of just you know pragmatic and practical human experience, just like today, right? You know, the people then were really, you know, no different than us. So, so textiles would have been far more uh, plenty than stone lithics, right? Although lithics are, are going to, they're going to stand the test of time much, much better. But I mean, think about it in terms of like today, right? Are you going to clothe yourself in pocket knives or in Levi's, right? So Levi's obviously aren't going to last in the environment. So, but if you could, if, but if you could capture a site where everything was, was you know in situ as it was at the time that it was laid down with no degradation what would you find it, i think that's what you would find 20 to 1 or more ratio on those types of materials absolutely well again trailblazing pioneering work by james atavasio and tom de la Haye. please go back in the catalog of the seven ages audio journal and its many commentaries on the ancient past with guests like both of those two gentlemen, glad to have had them on the program, glad to see them contributing to a fantastic journal like Mammoth Trumpet. And I'll also say this, another place where you will find the wide range of different kinds of archaeological evidence from the ancient past, all ethically collected and presented for future generations to be able to enjoy, 
is over at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room in Sevierville, Tennessee. Our friend Chase Pipes and the fine folks there are always diligently working to try and educate the public and provide history in an accessible way for future generations. What's going on over at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room, Jason? Well, Chase has actually been on the road for the entire month. Uh, They're just wrapping up. So they were out at the Tucson Mineral and Gym Show, the largest gym show of its kind in the the country, maybe the world. And uh, they set up out there every year to bring you the very, very best in gyms, minerals, dinosaur bones, dinosaur teeth, meteorites, and of course, the annual Tucson rib-off. Unfortunately, Chase was not able to bring home the trophy this year, but... uh, pretty sure he was the winner last year so they have a a great rib cook-off out there between all of the vendors and it sounds like a great time he came straight back home washed his laundry jumped back in the van and headed off to kentucky for the show of the shows is uh, what it's referred to and it's actually the largest military artifact show in the country so he's up there wheeling and dealing to bring the very best artifacts back to the relic room and again staying busy as he always does Uh, of course a lot of this stuff's going to be there at the newly expanded Relic Room in Sevierville, Tennessee, inside the Smoky Mountain Knife Works. But it will also be found on the website at therelicroom.com. And again, as always, as we kick off the uh, new year here with new episodes, we thank the uh, Relic Room and the Smoky Mountain Knife Works for sponsoring us here at Seven Ages. Well, our many thanks to our friends at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. And of course, Jason, I know you've been busy in recent days managing the Patreon page over there. What's going on? What's new in the Crosstime Pub? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The Patreon is officially up and off and running. So we encourage everyone to pop over there and help us support uh, everything that we do. We've got a lot of great product over there, a lot of extra content. If you love what we do here, we do it there on a lot more uh, regular basis. We're able to get you a lot more of the news stories and uh, special guest interviews, things like that. So we have the Crosstime Pub, which is a separate podcast over there for you uh, on the Patreon. It's exclusively for our Patreon members. We also have the show Digging Deeper, where we do sit-down interviews with some of your favorite guests. And I really dig deep into individual topics, their careers, and explore that as well. In the coming months, we're going to be adding a lot more over there on Patreon for you to enjoy. So we, again, encourage everyone to go over there, check out the various tiers that we have for you. That can be found at www.patreon.com slash seven ages podcast. Or if you uh, just go to Patreon, you could just search for seven ages podcast. It'll pop right up and uh, feel free to check out everything we're doing over there. We're having a great time with it. And so far we're getting a really good response, and I want to thank all of those people who have signed up. Indeed, thanks to all of you who have supported. And you'll notice, of course, Jason's really been leading the charge with a Patreon. You know, from time to time, it's going to be Jason, James. I'm actually going to be in there from time to time myself. I'm hoping to get down there to South America in the weeks ahead and to do some live reporting also, some special stuff as well. But again, I got to really hand it to Jason for leading the charge with a Patreon. Keep in mind, I'm running like five businesses over here on my end of things. I don't always have the time to do all of this stuff. And so I really appreciate the team, you know, picking up and and making sure that we have all of this excellent, great content that's going out on the Patreon pages. And obviously the response has been incredibly good to that. Also, of course, people are very pleased as is evidenced by the recent reviews we've been receiving. Jason, you want to fill us in on those? Yeah, as always, you know, reviews and ratings make the world go round. So they are extremely important to the growth of the show here at Seven Ages. And we certainly appreciate all of the listeners who take the time to do that for us. I got two for us this month. This one's coming from Evman2000, uh, titled On Point. So Seven Ages Audio Journal is a great podcast. The quality is top notch. They speak with authority on the subject and allow their guests to shine. I've lived in Ohio for decades now and created a hidden Ohio map, which pinpoints ancient American sites as well as other unusual places and events. So naturally, I was particularly interested in the episode with Dr. Brad Lepper and the one with Dr. Jared Burks. Both were fascinating. Uh, Evman, thank you for leaving that. And I'm glad you enjoyed those previous episodes as well. And then we have one more five-star review entitled Obsessed coming from Venus Dream. It simply says, Amazing binge. I want to drink Guinness and dig the past with these guys. So thank you very much for both of those reviews and uh, keep them coming because they do really help move the show up. 
on the algorithms, on all of the podcast catchers. And the more people that leave those ratings and reviews, the more people can discover what we do here at Seven Ages. And ultimately, it really, really helps out the show. So thank you for those uh, great reviews. And we look forward to seeing some more next time. Certainly. Venus Dream, come on down to the Cross Time Pub. Have a Guinness with us. And of course, Evman, great to see you up there in Kentucky in recent days. We appreciate your map. And we'll be using that when we are out on the road together. Look forward to seeing you on down the road. And of course, for everybody else there who would like to follow us online, we are on Instagram, Twitter. You can, of course, find us at sevenages.org and on our Facebook page as well. Jason maintains that and you can engage with us and you can actually be a part of the dialogue. But this week, the dialogue is going to be picking up on a conversation that the guys were recently a part of with Dr. David Kilby, a professor of anthropology with an interest in North American paleo Indians, hunter gatherer archaeology, Southwest prehistory. The Organization of Lithic Technology, Geoarchaeology, and so much more, which I'm sure he's going to tell you all about in the following segment that we feature with Dr. Kilby. Coming up next, right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Welcome back to the Seven Ages Audio Journal, where tonight we are excited to welcome Dr. David Kilby to the show. David Kilby is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the Texas State University. He completed his doctoral dissertation on Clovis caches and caching behavior at the University of New Mexico and maintains an ongoing research focus on Paleo-Indian archaeology and lithic technology. Other research interests include geoarchaeology, hunter-gatherer ecology, and southwestern prehistory. In pursuing these interests, he has had the opportunity to work with some of the classic western Paleo-Indian sites, including Blackwater Draw, Murray Springs, Mockingbird Gap, Folsom, and the Rio Rancho Folsom site, along with many others. He is co-director of the Ancient Southwest Texas Project, which conducts field research in the lower Pecos Canyonlands along the U.S.-Mexico border. Since 2016, his primary field work is focused on bonfire shelter. Dr. David Kilby, welcome to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Hello, and thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, you know, you've been on the list for quite a while, and it's, uh, it's our pleasure to finally be able to sit down and talk to you. I've uh, been following your work for the last few years, for sure, knew that you were somebody that we wanted to talk to here on the show. Of course, we are going to mainly focus on the bonfire shelter and your work there tonight. But I would be remiss if we didn't take this opportunity to introduce you formally to the audience and learn a little bit more about you. It's not every day we get to speak with someone who's had the experience of those classic Paleo-Indian Western sites. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let's begin there. Now, I understand that you are a North Carolina guy. I'm from South Carolina down here in Charleston. But uh, tell us how you got from Appalachian State out to the West to work with some of these famous Paleo-Indian sites. There is a whole sort of uh, long story there. I was, uh, I went to college at Appalachian to, to hopefully be a writer. That was my goal. And along the way, I took a, uh, a North American prehistory class just to fulfill an elective. And, and I just loved it. And I didn't have, I tell students sometimes, I, I didn't have any idea that you could uh, make a living doing archaeology. I'd always been interested. But I didn't know that you could do that professionally. And, and it turns out that you can just barely, if you really try. And so that got my attention. And within a, uh, I don't know, by the end of the semester, I had changed that to my minor, and by the next semester, I had changed that to my major. I uh, was lucky enough, I don't know if you know folks at Appalachian uh, very well, but Harvard Ayers did this uh, famous Southwest class that he did, where we'd spend about eight weeks intensively learning Southwest archaeology and anthropology, and then we would do this epic trip over spring break, spring break driving in vans, you know, down I-40, all the way to... uh, Albuquerque, and uh, and do this adventure across the Southwest, and I just fell in love with the West, and fell in love with Southwest archaeology. Yeah, and I, so I um I don't know I, I I kept following that notion, and I didn't end up doing a internship in Utah for a summer, and uh you know that only made it worse. And so I decided when I went to uh, grad school that I was going to go in New Mexico. So I went to ENMU, which is a 
you know, by some standards, a small university, um, but by New Mexico standards, it's the third largest university in the state. But for me, this thing that was sort of, uh, I guess, career altering about that was it was right there at the Blackwater Draw site. Um, they are the managers of the Blackwater Draw site. And so I, I went there to study you know, Pueblo and archaeology, and I did do a a thesis that was sort of a geoarchaeological look at Kivas in the Four Corners area. Um, but along the way, I was, uh, you know, an, a student employee at Blackwater Draw, and I just got more and more drawn into to that world and thinking about, um, you know, Pleistocene archaeology. And it had this, you know, added element of not only being prehistoric, but an entirely different world, you know, with um, extinct beasts walking around and, and folks that are living under a completely different climate regime. And I was sold. And I lived in New Mexico for the following 25 years, I think being at there and at UNM where I specifically started looking at Clovis and got involved with uh, research on Clovis caches that I'm, I'm still involved with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, again, to have the experience that you have and the pedigree of working at all of these famous sites, you know, it's, uh, I can't say I blame you. It's uh, the Paleo Indian in the late Pleistocene is certainly a time period that I think is attractive to anyone who's really a proponent of archaeology, wanting to know the initial peopling of America and all of the, the mystery that kind of surrounds that. So, uh, again, you know, that would be fodder for a future show. Uh, there's much there that we could cover about your experiences out west at those famous sites such as Blackwater Draw, Murray Springs, and many others. Uh, so we will definitely have to have you back on the show. Now, when we get into the conversation tonight, we're talking about the Bonfire Shelter, and this is an area uh, in Texas that has very unique geology, uh, archaeology, and is part of a, a larger network, if you will, so when we're talking about bonfire shelter, where exactly in Texas are we looking and what is the general description of the area? We're looking at, at far southwest Texas. Um, so you are, it's the lower Pecos Canyonlands. It's where the Pecos River, which starts way up in the Rockies, joins the Rio Grande, which also starts way up in the Rockies. And they come together right there, just southeast of Big Bend. Most people know where Big Bend National Park is. And so... Um, it's Chihuahuan Desert country. It's sort of where the Chihuahuan Desert meets the plains. Um, you're right on the western edge of the Edwards Plateau, which is famous for these you know, excellent quality churches that outcrop considerably farther east than, than where we are. It's, it's that same landform. It's right on the border. Bonfire Shelter is located in Mile Canyon, which is uh, named because it's about a, a mile long. It's 1.5 kilometers long, deeply incised. It's just a little tributary that goes into the Rio Grande just north of where uh, the Pecos comes in. Okay, it's, yeah, and then so uh, yeah. as looking at the maps and visualizing it, I want to ask you about this. So, again, that's going to be the body of the conversation, but this is a part of a larger network, correct? Sure. So this, yeah, this particular, well, the region is famous for, you know, historically for Judge Roy Bean and railroads and, and uh, Indian Wars and all of that. It, prehistorically, there's a lot going on there as well. It's famous for, obviously, the, the rock art. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the Pecos River style rock art, this sort of multicolored, elaborate murals. Um, the White Shaman mural is one that's gotten a, a lot of news attention in the past few years. Um, Carolyn Boyd would be another great guest to have on the show sometime if you want to talk about the rock art of the Lower Pecos. But the, just that, you know, one and a half mile long tributary canyon that Bonfire Shelter occurs in has uh, five other rock shelters um, that are occupied prehistorically, as well as a couple of open-air sites. Uh, Bonfire is probably the best known. Eagle Cave is the largest and maybe a close second to Bonfire in, in being widely recognized. But um, what the region is mostly known for are these, in addition to the rock art, are these earth oven uh, features that people are using to uh, to process desert plants on in some cases on a really grand scale, and this is you know this is hot rock cooking. This is heating rocks to a high temperature and and burying them along with plant materials and and probably also protein, and letting them cook for days. And you have um, you know people maintaining these sometimes in the rock shelters, sometimes in the shelters above. And that's not to get too off on an aside here, but that's one of the things that's sort of interesting and characteristic about the region is as other people farther west, you know, in the southwest, are getting more and more invested in agriculture. The people of, uh, of West Texas are invested in plant processing via these earth ovens. They're doing the same sort of thing. 
more grinding, more processing, more sort of you know extraction of, of resources through labor. But it doesn't take the form of agriculture. It takes the form of this, this oven cooking. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, you know, that's something I've just recently been reading about and learning more about as well. So as we begin to get into Bonfire Shelter itself and everything that makes it uh, the location that has become famous for these various uh, time periods of occupation, David, what is it about this particular shelter that is so appealing for Paleo-Indian studies? What is it there that we find that makes it a prime location for you and your team? So Bonfire is, is different than all those other sites that I described in that it doesn't appear to be one of these big plant processing features. Um, bonfire is it's significant for a number of reasons, but the big things that are attractive to a Paleo-Indian archaeologist um, and the things that it's most famous for are these series of, of bone beds, um, two of which appear to be large-scale bison kills interpreted as, as bison jumps, meaning you know, literally stampeding herds off the cliff above. And then the third and lower layer, which is um, which includes Pleistocene, late Pleistocene fauna, Rancho Librean fauna, mammoth and horse and camel and all that good stuff, um, which are sort of an ambiguous origin. It's not clear whether they're related to human activity or whether they are there naturally. And so all of these things together um, have invited investigation and invited some debate over interpretation over the years, which makes it a, a really intriguing site to work at. So uh, what's the geologic setting there? I mean, is it is it sedimentary rock? Is it igneous rock? You know, I know it's kind of been an area of a talus slope and obviously a canyon area, but I was just curious. We, we were talking about the, uh, you know, the, the fires that they used to cook. I thought, you know, it's kind of like the original Dutch oven. But then I got to thinking, well, what kind of rock tops are we, you know, are we talking about here? It, it's a limestone landscape. Um, okay. al- it's uh, almost all of the layers are Cretaceous limestone. And so, you know, fairly um, easily dissolved by erosion and by rainwater, and so there are karst features. That's one of the interesting things about the, the canyon itself. It's been interpreted as, as possibly just a karst collapse. Oh, yeah. So a big karst tube um, that's collapsed in on itself and turned into an open canyon and then the side start eroding. And, and there's some indications of that. When you look up at the, at the rim of the canyon, you get these sort of features that stick out like maybe it used to be an overarching ceiling to a cavern. And then it ends um, on the... Uh, it, it sort of dead ends in a plunge pool, which is definitely an opening into underground. That's that's actually even more interesting than I thought it was going to be. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's a pool location. Yeah, it, yeah. it sounds like it. Yeah, so um, yeah, so yeah, that currently, I guess the other thing to add in there because this will come into play when we start talking about differing interpretations. It's currently scoured out to to boulders and bedrock in the bottom of the canyon, but it looks like during the late Pleistocene. Uh, several episodes of it backfilling and having a more sediment-laden floodplain within the canyon would have made it shallower and maybe grassier. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, and we would encourage everyone to, there's lots of great pictures of it online, um, and Dr. Kilby has produced several papers that have great graphics, great photos. So yeah, feel free to look it up and get a, get a visual because uh, once I actually saw how it was laid out and saw the, the diagrams and the drawings, um, this conversation will make a lot more sense if you've gone and looked at the way that it's shaped. It's very, very unique feature. And I can certainly see why it would have been important to uh, anyone who was passing along that area from any time period. It certainly would have provided some very unique shelter. So as we get more into the details of it, now that we have a, a good idea of kind of how it looks, there's so much there as far as information. And I know that you, you're, you and your team are constantly learning more about it, but let's, let's get into some of the, uh, the fine details. So the, the fact that it is recognized has a, a bison jump and possibly one of the oldest ones in North America. Talk about what that looks like from the archaeological perspective and how you begin to process something like that from the viewpoint of archaeology. I think that's one of the things that first made the site stick out as, as being of archaeological interest is that, that Mike Collins, sort of one of these great um, father figures of, of Texas archaeology associated with golf and, and lots of other cool research. He apparently became aware of it as a teenager. He was friends with the landowners, his families were, and he was one of the first people to notice that these bones on the floor uh, were not cattle, but they were bison. And um, and so 
that is part of what I think drew the attention of archaeologists, um, as well as just this sort of abundant archaeological record of the surrounding region. And what uh, I hope this is not veering off from the question that you asked, but just sort of the, the, the history of what brought people there. Um, when Amistad Reservoir was being built, um, part of the salvage, uh, the Reservoir Salvage Act required them to go in and test and mitigate particular sites that would be affected by the reservoir. And um, Dibble sort of, I think, used that as an excuse, really, to do more testing at this site because it really wasn't going to be directly pack- impacted by the reservoir. But they were able to argue that at the highest lake levels, that it would be accessible to tourists and hikers and stuff and would be um, vulnerable, you know, to looting and so on. And so under that uh, project, they were able to come in and and do some initial testing. And what they found is, yeah, sure enough, this bison bone is is coming up from a very context. And you get down about a, a meter deep and you have dense, heavily burned bison bone beds that are up to 80 centimeters thick. And so, you know, almost three feet thick of of just pure, uh, heavily burned, in some cases almost kind of melted, calcined bison bone associated with, with spear points, with mid to late archaic spear points that we call Castorville and Montel. And as they continued to excavate below that, they, they identified that there's another bison bone bed about a meter deeper than that, that is larger bison, Pleistocene bison, and they eventually find um, what they describe as plain view points associated with that. And wow. plain view is recognized as Paleo Indian, and you know, roughly twelve thousand years old, give or take. Um, yeah, that's absolutely incredible. And so, there does appear to be, at least to some degree, a fulsome component there as well. Is that correct? Exactly. And so, as part of excavating that older bison bone bed, which which we call bone bed two, they numbered the bone beds um, from bottom to top as a geologist would. And so, bone bed one is the is the oldest that that uh, late Pleistocene. When bone bed two is the Paleo Indian age bison deposit. Bone bed three is that archaic aged bison deposit. Um, so, in excavating bone bed two, they noticed that it's in in places it's in three distinct la- distinct layers, and um, some of it's associated with these you know plain view like points, and then they ended up with one Folsom point. And this is you know one of those sort of one of those kind of frustrating stories that's traditional to archaeology, that Folsom point was found where it had just fallen out of the profile. So they didn't mm. catch it in place. They're pretty sure that it came from that lowermost level of those three three layers in bone bed, too. And that would make sense. It should be stratigraphically below plain view. Yes. Um, and so they had, you know, a, uh, a handful of these lanceolate, late Paleo-Indian looking points, and then one Folsom point. It turns out later on, going back through the collections, when SMU archaeologists were going back through the collections, they identified a tiny little fragment of a biface that had been collected as a biface fragment. Um, they recognized that as a corner of the ear of another Folsom point. And so there are two Folsom points associated with it. That's incredible so, that they were able to, to locate another piece like that. And then, of course, right, in the collections. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I do have a, a quick question. I want you to kind of describe the plain viewpoint because a lot of folks here on the East Coast who listen to the show are, aren't familiar with that type as much as they would be with the typical Clovis and Redstone and other types of uh, sure. paleo points. So what is a plain view as far as the, the general uh, diagnostics of it? It is a, a lanceolate point, which looks a lot like... Clovis in outline, uh, except that it's not fluted and tends to be quite a bit thinner. They're heavily ground on the sides. They're, they're quite variable, and it's one of these problems in the West is, is whether you want to lump a bunch of stuff into plain view or whether you want to try to subdivide that into some regional sure. traditions. And there's this ongoing problem of what's the relationship of, of plain view and mill iron. Um, mill iron is northern plains. Is it at all similar to like a Midland point? Uh, it is, Yeah. That would be a good, a, a good comparison. It's yeah, it's very thin, like a midland, um, not quite as eared the way a midland or a Folsom would be. It's got a, a, a slightly concave base, but not really eared. And they tend to be in the same size range as as Folsom as well. Okay. Ev- everywhere, excluding mill iron, ev- everywhere where Folsom and Plainview occur together, Folsom is stratigraphically below Plainview. But it appears to be, and everywhere that we have dates, Folsom appears to predate Plainview. 
Okay. And, and those dates, as far as we know, don't really overlap. All right. And so for referring back to what you just said about the stratigraphy of the site, it would make sense then for sure that that, that Folsom should be below the plain view. Right. Based and off so of that, every other site. Yeah. And why that kind of matters is that, you know, the original excavators uh, proposed that there had been as many as three different jumps in this in bone bed tube. And that the, the earliest one was associated with Folsom and the later ones are probably associated with plain view. And that interpretation gets uh, second-guessed later on, and that leaves us with you know the explanation of this anomalous Folsom. If it's a single jump, then that means Folsom people and Plainview people are not only there at the same time, but they're cooperating in this hunt, you know? Yeah. Um, which is, uh, I don't know, would, would be really cool to be able to demonstrate, but also is maybe not the most parsimonious explanation for, for why they both occur there. Yeah, and let let me just take an aside here for a minute because oftentimes, you know, it's paleo points especially are always kind of described as it was this and then it was this and then it was this and then it was this. Um, Very rarely do we seem to get confirmation of overlapping of those time periods uh, like you just described. And I know that you've done some more recent work, not necessarily at Bonfire, but in dating that sort of overlap. Can you speak to that a little bit as we may interpret, you know, rather than just changing from one style to another? How much evidence do we see, especially out west, of overlapping of cultures or of at least techno complexes? Right. Yeah, it's always important to remember, and I always have to sort of remind myself that we're we're basing all this sort of population scale and cultural scale, I, all, all these ideas on, on one kind of tool, you know, and we're talking about points as if they equal culture or equal populations. And, and really, they're just tools that vary, and they may vary among and within populations. And we talk about these sequences of projectile points, you know, these are changes in cultural traits that, that evolve through time, and it might happen abruptly or it might happen, you know, very gradually. And so I think what you may be referring to, I was um, uh, lucky enough to work with Briggs Buchanan and a couple of other folks and being able to look at a Bayesian analysis of Clovis and Folsom radiocarbon dates and using, you know, dates that we're very confident in the context for and in the reliability of the dates and comparing those statistically, it looks like there is as much as a 200-year overlap between Clovis and Folsom. Wow. Um, which suggests that Folsom is an innovation that occurs within Clovis and gradually spreads and becomes more abundant and, and comes to fixation within what was previously Clovis, Clovis populations. And, you know, and, and we do this in geology especially, but in archaeology too, we kind of throw numbers around for, you know, numbers of years and, you know, there's a 200-year overlap, but in the in the human sense, that's a really long time. Right, it's eight, over. Eight I mean, how many generations is that? You know, it's eight generations. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's nothing. Just looking back, you know, through the long telescope of time, but two hundred years is a long time for people. You know, and that's a lot of. That's a slow change, I think, in in sort of a more simple technology. You know, where you know where you've got a group that sort of makes something like this, and within that group, you've got a few people that are really good at it. You know, and make some really nice stuff, and then some. Most everybody else just kind of makes you know average stuff, and then you've got another group, and they kind of get ideas from each other, and then over time, and whatever the other drivers of that are, you know, personality and culture and belief right. systems and all of that, those things kind of take a while to kind of meld together and you know form some kind of third type of uh, artifact or culture or you know material or, or whatever you want to call it. A different toolkit. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a fascinating discussion and one that we've we've had many times here. Uh, here in the southeast, yeah. we talk about the Clovis and the Redstone, very similar to the Folsom, uh, at least at time period wise, and uh, tool assisted fluting and all of those type of things as we begin to see those changes. But returning to the conversation at hand, getting back to bonfire shelter, we talk about the Ice Age megafauna that's present there, and right. so. Date wise, you mentioned it earlier, but are we truly seeing, just so that we all understand, uh, between the various layers in those bone beds, and we will get more into the bone beds for the listener, but are you seeing a different species, such as like bison antiquus versus a, a later species? So we're seeing two different identifiable species there, is that correct? For, for bison specifically? Yes, for bison specifically. Uh, 
both Bone Bed 2 and the earlier uh, Pleistocene Bone Bed 1 are, are Bison Antiquus. Okay. There's been a little talk about, you know, distinguishing Bison Antiquus from Bison Occidentalis, but, but that's, you know, basically the, these are Pleistocene Bison. The Bone Bed 3, the Archaic Kill, is Modern Bison. Okay. And so that's, we have at least, yeah, two, what we would consider two different species of bison there from these three different time periods. Yeah, that's fascinating. And as far as the numbers, so based off the bones, and I know this would have to be a zooarchaeologist sort of either dream or nightmare having to try to go in there and sort through all of these bones, (laughs) right? So uh, is there like a general number, like how many do we think are present from at least what can be seen from the stratigraphy? As you might find with lots of questions about bonfire shelter, there are going to be long answers. <laughs> okay. um, and so, but I think it's I think it's worthwhile because this is part of the debate. And sure. So, um, when Dibble and, and Lorraine, the first investigators to look at it closely in in the nineteen uh, sixties, um, estimated the number of bison that are there for for bi- bone bed three, the archaic one, they estimated as many as eight hundred bison. Wow. Um, and for bone bed two, the Paleo Indian level, they estimated one hundred and twenty. Hmm. Um, and, and the way they came up with that, Decime Lorraine, the co-author, was a paleontologist, and so she's approaching it as a, you know, as a paleontologist might. Sure. So they looked at the number of individuals they identified in their excavations, and then they projected that across the rest of the shelter, sort of with the assumption that density is the same throughout the, the shelter. And you know, as we've explored more uh, thoroughly in, in the shelter, that's clearly not true. And so those are probably real high, the high end of estimations. When others, and specifically uh, SMU, David Meltzer and Ryan Byerly came in and looked more closely in the early 2000s, they, for, specifically at Bone Bed 2, um, they saw that as a gross estimation, a gross uh, overestimation. And I think that's probably correct. And they estimated that maybe we're looking at more like about 24 animals um, in, in Bone Bed 2. And that would be more in line with a typical um, Paleo-Indian kill. Um, right. Paleontologically, bison, we don't think bison were moving in herds of thousands of animals in the Pleistocene the way they do in the Holocene. They're more like an elk herd, maybe 50 to a, to 100 animals at most. The range of interpretations. I've had, if I can just add one more thing. We've looked closely. I've had a student who is you know, specifically trained in zooarchaeology. Um, look at the additional elements that we've excavated and add that to the previous excavations, and his minimum number of individuals is, is 32. And so closer to that Meltzer um, estimation. But we also think both of those are literally minimal. You know, that's how sure. many we can see. Right. Uh, not including what's not been excavated. Now, the next question I have for you, since we're talking about, you know, the size of the herds and the animals literally coming off the cliff and and collapsing onto the rocks at the bottom. And this would obviously have to be speculation to a degree, but what would we think that would have looked like from a Paleo-Indian perspective? So how may they have used their daily items to sort of drive those animals off the cliff? Are there any thoughts or ideas on how that may have looked? For starters, the, the landscape is sort of set up ideally uh, for that kind of um, strategy because you have these open grasslands and what would have been grasslands in the uplands just to the north and then sort of a narrower valley that you could easily maneuver a herd down and then you can, if, if you spook them at the right time, you can drive them over a blind hill and it turns out that that blind hill is a cliff, but you can't see it when you approach it from that side. Ah, very good. Um, is that the east side? That would be from the east. Yeah. Okay. I've been uh, I've been doing a little aerial recon here while okay. while we've talked, so I'm trying to get I've got a feel for it now. And so the the landscape is already set up uh, with sort of some naturally occurring drive lanes. Um, we know that people in the his, you know late prehistoric and, and the historic period used. Uh, rock walls and brush lanes and fires and and smoke and stuff to create drive lanes. And we don't have any evidence of that at Bonfire Shelter. You may not have needed it. Sure, yeah. But uh, it seems to to kind of be the perfect uh, storm, if you will, as, you know, that funneling ability to move them down and then, boom, right off the edge. So The other element to that blind hill is there is that funnel, this notch that's eroded in in the top of the cliff that really does, um, it, it sort of acts as a funnel. And once you're, once you're in that little, you can imagine it as sort of a, a deep arroyo 
um, that sort of ends instead of ending in a dead end, it ends in a drop off. Right. And um, and so it has this funneling effect, um, and, and the bison end up being deposited in the shelter right below it, and that's that talus cone that you hear. Right. Um, right. That very reference is this yeah. accumulation of debris below that notch. So, just for the listener, again, uh, I encourage everyone to go look at this, but how big is that funneled area as far as, you know, width for being able to fit animals through? Would it make sense that the amount of animals that are being projected down onto the floor below, would that make sense with the amount based off the size of the of the divot or the cone? Um, you know, it's probably, I hate to guess at a width because I would be wrong, but, you know, I think you could get two giant Pleistocene bison abreast <laughs> going through there sure. uh, at a time, but I, I don't think they necessarily have to go through that funnel. I think you probably had bison tumbling off just the, the edge of the cliff itself as well. Sure. You know, the idea I, I think most people are aware is, you know, you get a, a herd of animals spooked to the extent that the ones in front, once they realize they're getting ready to go over a precipice, even if they try to stop, the momentum of the herd behind them continues to push them over. And so I think, you know, Probably naturally they're inclined to run down into a draw, and that leads them down into that funnel. But others are probably be being pushed off the edge, you know, in areas sure. surrounding that funnel as well. So when we get down, you mentioned that very um, that very thick part of the stratigraphy of the burned bones. So right. what do we attribute the burning to? Or is that just a processing area? Is that a hearth area, or is it something that's more widespread? That's one of the other mysteries. Um, it, it is the namesake of the shelter. Um, Bone Bed 3 in particular is, is very heavily burned. And it's not clear if that happened on purpose um, you know, by, by people or if it's something that just resulted from a grass fire you know, after the fact, after people have long abandoned the site. Um, or you know, it's also been proposed. You've, you've got people you know, continuing to visit the canyon and work in the canyon um, in the aftermath of that kill, and eventually it's going to reek, and it's going to draw scavengers, you know, bears and wolves, and, and you know, maybe that's something you send the, the teenagers up the canyon to go burn one day. You get tired of it, you know. Yeah, but absolutely. It is thoroughly burned, and it was probably burned early enough on that it still had some tissue. Um, mm-hmm. Clearly, it, it burned it burned hot, and so presumably there's, there, there's fat and decaying tissue and stuff there that sort of went up like, a, like an oil lamp. Yeah, yeah I, I had actually considered that because I thought that had to be just the worst smelling thing of all time. Right. You know, for, you know, when you've got all, all that, uh, all those carcasses piled up like that. So that actually does make a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. And looking at the photographs of, of that burn area, it's kind of striking because you have solid bone and then just beneath that, some of the bone has been burned so severely that it appears to be almost an ash form. Is that correct? Right, yeah, and the very lowermost part of, uh, of Bone Bed 3, it has this, it, it's heavily reduced, so it's almost kind of bluish green in color, yeah. and almost has a f- consistency of like felt, a really loose felt. Wow. And um, my interpretation of that is that it is pooled you know, oil and tissue and fat that just, that just smoldered for a long period of time and just completely reduced those organics to a, uh, but just a dense ash deposit, and you get this um, um, oxidation of the underlying sediments, where you you know you burn two or three inches into the sediments that are underlying it as well. It was a hot, I think, and long burning fire. Yes, it's an absolutely incredible place, and the more we learn about it, the more interesting it becomes. Uh, not only a cave or a shelter of fire, but also one of ice. So it has been referred to sort of an ice box cave, if you will. So uh, explain how that name came about, but then again, it has to do with the access and the and the shelter itself, right? Sure. Uh, the, the, the shelter itself um, was once a larger... It was never, not technically, not geologically a cave, but it was a much deeper rock shelter. And this is presumably long before humans have occupied it. The brow erodes and collapses. And so you have this big boulder wall that basically closes, closes off the entrance to the rock shelter. And so there's only two narrow passages that you can enter from the north and from the south, either, either by foot or by hoof. Um, and otherwise, that sort of wall of, of fallen boulders blocks out any sunlight. And so you couple that with the fact that it faces, you know, roughly northwest. It doesn't get any direct sunlight. And so it stays cool um, throughout much of the year, and it's, and it's real damn cold in the winter. 
and that's where the term icebox cave came from. There's not literally, um, you know, ice that occurs in it, although it's it's not an entirely dry rock shelter, but there's not a, uh, you don't have groundwater or anything in there that freezes. Right. But I, I think some of the crew started referring to it as icebox cave back in the 1960s because they worked year-round, and, you know, it was cold as whiz in that cave. It just never warmed up. You know, even on a warm right. afternoon, it stayed cold in there. But sure. that has potential benefits, for, you know, from the perspective of people who are processing meat um, in that location because you have sort of a, you know, relatively refrigerated atmosphere. You've got the ability to take a little more time with the butchering and processing before the meat spoils and so on. Yeah, and then also the the protection of the shelter maybe from larger predators or whatnot as right. well. So, yeah, it's very, very interesting. James? Yeah, and and I've been out west quite a bit, too. I, you mentioned the field trips earlier. We used to do the New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Montana stuff, so it's kind of brought right. back to memories. But one thing that I don't think people that have never been out west appreciate is how dry the air is. And there's so low humidity that – if you're someplace on a hot summer day, you can step into the shade and it's literally cooler in the shade. Like in the South, it's kind of hot, you know, it's kind of the same temperature everywhere just because of the humidity. So I can appreciate how, you know, if it was wintertime, even if you were in the sun, it feel, felt pretty warm. You could step in there and how, what the temperature gradient would be probably right. pretty significant. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's, it's pretty luxurious as an archeologist because, you know, we tend to work there in the early summer and by the end of our field season, it's, you know, it's often getting into the, the hundreds in the afternoon, but you don't feel it in there until you step out, until right. you know, we have a pretty long climb getting back out of the canyon and back to the vehicles. And then, you know, it's 105 outside, but <laughs> right. the working conditions inside the shelter are, are pretty awesome. Yeah, I bet. Except in the winter when it's cold enough that the few times we've worked in the winter, we actually have propane heaters down there and you can go over and warm your hands up periodically. Wow. You find that people take more notes um, when there's a heater to go sit beside while you do it, you get much, much more thorough notes in those kind of situations. Interesting. Yeah, so it it seems that, and I'll return to bone bed too for just a moment, because uh, it seems that that kind of seems to be a main focus of the archaeology there. And now I realized in some of the stuff I was reading about the shelter that the date ranges are obviously very important. And bone bed two itself, because of all that burned material and everything, what was the difficulty of getting date ranges and what are the date ranges within that particular bone bed? So for bone bed two, there are literally a handful of dates, four or five dates, and they're all in the, this is calibrated radiocarbon years. So you know, literally years before present between about 11,500 and 12,000 uh, years old, um, which is what you might expect for, for plain view. Sure. Um, it's not what you would expect for, for Folsom. That's late for Folsom. Right. Um, but the caveat is all of those dates are from the uppermost level. And so we don't have any date that overlaps with the known range of Folsom. And, and that's because we're having trouble getting good bone dates. And that's not necessarily because of the burning. Um, it's because it's not entirely dry and there's just no collagen preservation. Okay. When I started this, I went in naively thinking, I'm going to solve... You know, all these um, chrono- chronology problems um, by bone dating. You know, in the 1960s, you could barely get a good date with bone because they hadn't figured out how to uh, how to filtrate the old dead carbon out and all of that, um, the calcium out. And so I'm thinking now with AMS dating, we're going to be able to go in and just really intensively date these and look at it statistically and be able to tell whether it's one event or two events or three events and exactly how old each of those are. But it didn't work out that way. Um, that those bones just do not yield good dates because the, the collagen's gone. And so we've, we've struggled with getting, we've gotten additional dates that confirm the previously existing dates, but they're from that same upper level where there happened to be a little hearth um, that spread some charcoal around and we can date that charcoal. But I'm working with, with Tom Stafford now to see if we can get dates um, basically on Denton within teeth. He said that, that may be our best bet for some remaining collagen. And so that's been a fun avenue to pursue. We've, we've actually done CAT scans of some of the molars to see where the densest, best preserved part of the, in, best preserved part of the interior of the molars are. And then Stafford's going to be able to drill in and, and micro sample those and 
he says, if we get it there, that's if we get it, that's where we're going to get it. And if we don't, then we're not going to get it. We're not going to be able to date that bone. Right. So that's kind of your your last shot yeah, at getting some Hail Mary. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's your Hail Mary. Exactly. So, uh, well, to this point, the majority of the conversation has revolved around um, the paleo implements, but I do want to give uh, some due diligence to the archaic folks uh, who may have been present there at the bonfire shelter as well. So when we talk about the archaic bone bed there, or the archaic, archaic stratigraphy, we are, are we talking early, mid, late archaic, and what exactly are we using to associate it with the archaic? Right. And, and that's a, uh, at least a two-part answer also. Uh, the bone bed itself is associated with projectile point styles that are pretty well dated from the surrounding region. Um, Castorville points and Montel points. And both of these are late archaic, 2,500 to 3,000 years old, that are um, known to be used across the, uh, the southern plains in that part of Trans-Pecos in Texas. They very well may be contemporary with one another. Uh, which brings up some fun stuff sort of anthropologically to think about is that do they represent different groups coming together, cooperating for a hunt that are carrying, you know, slightly different projectile point styles because they're from slightly different cultural traditions. And we also find it easier to date uh, Bone Bed 3 just because it's younger. And so we've got, you know, dates cluster really well, like I said, right, right in a, a little older than 2,500 years ago. The second part of my answer is that between bone bed two and bone bed three, and this is mostly in the shelter interior, are a series of early and middle archaic features that have really been sort of under investigated. And they're, they're clearly thermal features. When I first saw them, I thought these are small campfire hearths. Um, as we excavated a couple of those, it looks like they're small earth ovens. And so these are little mini versions of the plant processing facilities that we see done at a more grand scale up and down the rest of the canyon. And, and part of what's exciting about that is some of them are quite early. Um, one of them is right around 7,000 years old, so that's going to be early archaic. Um, some of the earliest ones known in the region and, and uh, well-preserved, uh, good charcoal, well-dated, and we're even getting some macrobotanical information out of there that tells us what they're burning for fuel wood, um, what the environment was like at the time, and so on. So far, we haven't gotten food remains. Um, it's all been fuel wood. And so the next step there is to try to do some residue analysis on some of those stones and see if we can get um, anything in the way of carbohydrates that are recognizable. Right. And so the portion of the shelter that has currently been excavated, and I know you're, one of your goals is to go in and do some backfilling of those earlier excavations to maintain right. the site, but... As far as sort of unexcavated portion of the site, where are you at as far as future plans for that? And does it seem necessary to do further investigations throughout the rest of the cave that isn't currently excavated? Right. Um, part of our whole goal of, of ASWT, of the Ancient Southwest Texas Project in, in general, and Bonfire in particular, part of, part of our whole goal and, and sort of our mantra is high resolution and low impact. And so what that means is we've tried to go in and instead of opening up lots of new excavations um, in the name of, of sort of preservation and conservation, we've opened up previous excavations where they're not already exposed and tried to resample their profiles, do a, a, some minimal excavation in the form of column samples into those profiles without li leaving as much of the site intact as we can. And so for that reason, we've, we've not opened up a lot of new sort of, you know, traditional block excavations. Um, the high resolution part of that is trying to do things that previous excavators didn't have available to them. Um, doing some geoarchaeology, doing AMS dating, uh, trying to get, uh, well, doing 3D modeling is, a, is another part of this. So we can go in and really look at how these strata sort of are, are deposed across the site as a whole, trying to connect strata from different excavation units um, to build sort of a depositional history for the whole uh, for the whole shelter. Yeah, and that technology that you're describing there, that 3D imaging, your YouTube presentation on Bonfire Shelter, which again, I suggest everyone go take a look at because there's lots of great pictures and graphics in there. And there's a still shot of one of those 3D renderings. And the detail is absolutely incredible. And with a site that 
is this dense with that many type of features and bone and all of that. I think it's the perfect place for that sort of technology. Uh, also getting back to the ancient Southwest Texas project that you just mentioned, you know, that's obviously a key component to the research there. Tell us a little bit more detail about the ancient Southwest Texas project. How big of an area does it encompass? And are there other areas in the area in this particular region that you plan on uh, making part of that project? Sure. Um, first, I, I want to say, though, that all those um, cool 3D models and graphics, I can't really take any, any credit from for those specifically. They are you know, a benefit of working with younger and more technologically savvy and, and progressive um, students and, and colleagues. And it's a, it's a technology that uh, some people brought into ASWT that has really been a great benefit and really fun to work with. In answer to, to what you're asking about ASWT, it was formed by Dr. Steve Black, who is an, another sort of very experienced Texas archaeologist that goes way back, long history in CRM and in, in academic research. Um, he established it in 2009 uh, with the goals of specifically focusing on this area of the Lower Pecos. And most of it focused specifically on Mile Canyon. Although the, the larger sort of region of interest is sort of the northern Chihuahuan Desert. So including the southwest Texas, um, that adjacent parts of northern Mexico, adjacent parts of southeastern New Mexico, this, this whole region. Um, and the goals, the goals there, he established it, like I said, in 2009 um, with the goals of improving understanding of the archaeological record of that larger region. He's you know, argued, and I think correctly, that it's been under-investigated. Um, it's one of those places that's between regions that have seen more investigation. It's between the Southwest and the Plains, and it's sort of this weird trans transitional place in between that has its own cultural distinctions that are that are relatively poorly known in comparison. Right. Um, so, I mean, as we, we return one last time tonight to the Bonfire Shelter, I want to give you an opportunity sure. to talk about uh, the future of that Canyonland area, future of Bonfire Shelter, uh, and also the the other sites that are adjacent to it. So, what does the future look like? Uh, are there more plans for excavation in there, or in the other areas, or in that general region? What do you have coming up? Um, fortunately, for this particular region, the future looks really good. Um, we have been blessed all along by working with really cooperative and preservation minded landowners. And they uh, have, have you know, worked with ASWT lockstep up in not only encouraging research, but um, making part of that research agenda preservation and stabilization. And so part of our promise to them and going into uh, to Bonfire Shelter was that um, as, as we complete what was going <laughs> to originally was going to be just a few little analyses we want to do before we start stabilizing the site. But part of our agreement with them is that we will um, backfill um, not only our own excavations, but these uh, series of open excavations from the 1960s and from the 1980s um, that have just been um, standing open for decades. And they're relatively stable because they're in a rock shelter, but as I said, it's not entirely dry. And so when you have heavy downpours, you do get water that runs through there. We've got some erosion and slumping of those walls. Um, and, and damage to the deposits that's just occurred as a result of time. So we are actually going out at spring break to put in what I think is going to be sort of a Herculean effort of just manually, the old-fashioned way, using shovels and wheelbarrows, um, getting this enormous back dirt pile back into these holes, shoring up some of the major profiles, and, and getting the surface stabilized. And, and part of the challenge of that is this this funnel and talus cone that we described with regard to the bison jumps, that's still active. And so in heavy runoff, you have water that pours through there like a gutter, and it lands right on top of that talus cone, which is where these important deposits are. And so our part of our solution, um, they did some stabilization in the 90s, but that was beginning to erode away. We, um, and, and I, I say we, but mostly it was the, the brainchild of Steve Black and Charles Koenig, uh, fashioned a, a big, they call it a, a mattress. It's a big wire uh, mesh cage and you fill it with rocks and rubble. Probably seen them on construction sites. And that it's about the size of a king size bed mattress and that sits atop the talus cone now. So when you get water that pours off the top, it hits that protective layer instead of eroding into the talus cone. Very good. Uh, 
uh, one quick question for you concerning what you just described, that spring break effort that you have coming up, uh, will that be an opportunity for any volunteers or is that only university staff and part of your crew? Uh, we've tried to make it open to the various crew members that have worked there over the years. Um, so crews and, and volunteers and friends. It, it does include volunteers, but we're sort of full up. And so I wish I could okay. say, everybody, come on down. Um, but I, I, I think we've got as many as we can sort of logistically handle. All right. Well, at least you have them. That's always important. Yeah. Yeah. The good news is we got lots of, of, of good, hardworking people with good minds and strong backs. So. Absolutely. Well, it has certainly been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I think one for the books. And I do want to give you an opportunity uh, to talk about for a moment here, this new paper that's just come out. I just saw it earlier today uh, on social media. So tell us a little bit about the new research that you're a part of in this new paper that's just come out. So that particular research was was a collaborative effort led by Briggs Buchanan and involving several other authors and we, uh, what we tried to do is amass the best and most reliable Clovis dates that we had in the West, in, in the range that overlaps with Folsom geographically, along with the best and most reliable Folsom dates that we have, to try and look at this transition from, from Clovis to Folsom. And, and what we found is that there, that there is a gradual transition that lasts as much as 200 years. And as you mentioned before, that would be eight generations. So that suggests that there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of implications there. One is it's an example of how new traits emerge and, and how they're transmitted throughout existing populations. More specifically for Clovis and Folsom, it suggests that there's not a hiatus between the two. It's a continuous population on the landscape and new cultural variants spread throughout that population. Certainly something that would be of interest to anyone listening to this show. And Dr. Kilby, where was that published? That's published and should be the most recent issue of American Antiquity. American it's Antiquity. It's available online. Um, it's, the, uh, it's not, the print version is not out yet, but you can find it online. All right. Very good. So something to keep your eye out for. I know I will want to read that entire article uh, and something that, again, would think would be perfect for this conversation here tonight. We have been speaking with Dr. David Kilby from Texas State University co-director of the Ancient Southwest Texas Project. Dr. Kilby, thank you so much for joining us here tonight on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thank you guys for having me. It's been lots of fun. Look forward to hearing it. Fantastic job. You know, due to a scheduling situation, I wasn't able to be there for that. But you guys, as always, shine and bring the very best from the ancient past. Dr. Kilby is somebody I would definitely love to talk to at some point, though, and I hope that we can definitely get him back on at some point. I enjoy just being able to kick back and listen to a conversation like that. Somebody so knowledgeable. And again, the Clovis culture, or techno-complex, really, as we've defined it, and as many archaeologists prefer to refer to it, it remains arguably my main focus, my number one you know, interest as far as North American archaeology. And we're still learning so much about that period in history, aren't we, guys? Yes, we absolutely are. And people like David uh, are leading the, the charge on this research. I'm very excited to have uh, made that contact with him. I hope to speak with him more in the future. And, you know, we're going to keep doing it here on Seven Ages. We have a lot of great shows lined up for you, covering all the realms of archaeology from all different time periods. But the uh, peopling of America, the Clovis culture will always be close to our heart. We hope to bring you some more great episodes focused on that time period coming up here soon on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Indeed. You know, the only thing, and I'll just point this out as we're kind of closing, gents, although we do have in the historical record certain evidence of perishable technologies, something that we don't have enough of, almost any of, when it comes to ancient North America, is that social lubricant that we all gather together and enjoy here in the Cross Time Pub. I would definitely miss that if we traveled back in time. But in the way that we do it every time that we gather together here in this Cross Time Pub, gentlemen, I certainly enjoy going back in time, and I couldn't imagine better time-traveling companions than the two of you, and of course, everybody out there who joins us 
on each edition of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So, fellas, I guess it's about that time once again, isn't it? It is indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, as always, head on over to sevenages.org. Get caught up on the back catalog. Of course, you can also learn about what we are doing. You can follow us on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, on social media of all kinds. Anywhere that there is something to be said about the ancient past, you will in likelihood find we three, James Waldo, geologist extraordinaire, Jason Pintrail, and of course, yours truly, I am Micah Hanks. We are the Seven Ages Research Associates, and we will catch you guys next time right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Audio Journal.